Hey guys, we have a couple of labs to do, um, but I want to remind you of a couple of things from Physics 153 before we get started. The first lab has to do with the magnetic dipole immersed in a magnetic field experiencing a torque. But the essential physics of what's going on is actually very similar to the physics of a mass on a spring. So I want to review that a little bit um, and then talk about the torque acting on this magnetic dipole in that context. So um, let's, let's take a minute. If you remember, if you've got a mass, say, connected to a spring, let's say it's on a frictionless horizontal surface. So there's no friction here. So mu equals zero. What are the, um, how does that work? So if the mass is displaced a little bit from equilibrium, say, some distance x, so that's the distance from equilibrium, it's going to stretch the string, the spring, excuse me, and you remember that the force on a stretched spring is minus the spring constant times the displacement, or I guess in physics 153, we probably called that s, the stretch. But I'm going to measure x, I'm going to call that equilibrium position the origin, and measure x relative to that. So I think I'm, I'm also in this argument, I'm going to be using x as the displacement from equilibrium or the stretch of that string, spring. Excuse me. Now the point is, if I have a force that's minus the uh, displacement of the mass, you know that that's also equal to dp dt, right? So that's the momentum principle. I can apply that momentum principle to figure out what the motion of the of the object is. Uh, dp dt, of course, p is mass times velocity if we're not going near the speed of light, and we're not. So that means dp dt is nothing other than m times dv dt, since m is constant. But of course, v is dx dt, so this is also m times the second derivative of x squared, right? The second derivative of x with respect to time. And I can put that back in for the rate of change momentum here. And I get this interesting result, that the mass times the second derivative of the position is minus a constant times the position. If you'll let me move the mass over to the other side of the equation, I get that the second derivative of x with respect to t is equal to minus k over m times x. Now that means the second derivative of x is minus a constant, that's a constant, times x again. Now what kind of functions do we know where you take the second derivative and you get the same function back again? Well, those are sines and cosines. So let's presume, let's assume that x is some kind of a sine function, some constant times t, call that constant omega, and then I'll take this, let's take the first derivative, that's going to give me um, omega a cosine omega t. Go ahead and take the second derivative. That's minus omega squared a sine omega t. Uh, wait a minute, that's minus omega squared times our original function of x, x of t. So I get d squared x dt squared is equal to minus omega squared times x of t. Up here I have d squared x dt squared is minus k over m times x of t. This is x of t, it's a function of time. And look, this omega squared obviously has to be the same thing as k over m. So what we get is that the momentum principle is happy uh, if this condition is satisfied. The second derivative of x says it has this relationship with x. And so I can make everybody happy if I can make omega squared equal to k over m. So that's the idea. Uh, when you have a mass on a spring, then it oscillates with a angular frequency. Remember, this, this is the angular frequency of the oscillation. It oscillates with an angular frequency of omega that happens to be equal to the square root of k over m. So we get the result, omega equals the square root of k over m. But what I want to point out is that this same relationship 
can show up in many different circumstances where the second derivative of a position like variable is equal to minus that a constant times that position like variable and you can immediately write down the answer that uh, coefficient of the displacement or the position like variable has got to end up being omega squared okay so uh, all right so let's go look at the magnetic dipole in a magnetic field okay so let's suppose we have a magnetic dipole now in a magnetic field. So I'm just going to sketch out here a magnetic field that's pointing to the right. Inside that magnetic field, I'm going to just insert a magnetic dipole. We'll put a north end and a south. This could be like a permanent bar magnet or something. It makes an angle theta with respect to that magnetic field, and it has a dipole moment mu. Okay. So then what we learned. Uh, in the chapter on magnetic forces was that the torque acting on that dipole is going to be um, mu cross b. Okay, So mu cross b, in that case, in this picture, if I point my fingers of my right hand in the mu direction, wrap them into b, that's going to be a clockwise torque. So this will be a clockwise torque in this the, the way this picture is. But notice a clockwise torque the angle is counterclockwise, but the torque is clockwise. If, on the other hand, the dipole had been below the horizontal, it would have been a counterclockwise torque, but then the angle would have been negative. So another way to think about that is the torque is always in the opposite sense of the angle. So uh, if I put in what the magnitude of that torque is, um, and give a sense of direction, it's going to be minus mu b sine theta. So I would say in this case, the if the plane of the paper is the xy plane, then I would write this that the z component of the torque is minus mu b sine theta. Okay. Now, if the angle is small, we know that theta is approximately equal to the sine of theta. So the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta if theta is much, much less than 1. Okay, If the angle is small, we made the same approximation when we studied the uh, simple pendulum in physics 153. If I put that in, I get that the net torque in the z direction is equal to minus mu b theta. That's like the momentum principle. Um, well, this just tells you what the force is. The momentum principle says the force is equal to the angular momentum principle, of course, says the force, the net torque, is equal to the rate of change of the angular momentum, L. Mm -hmm. And this, in this case, it's spin. It's uh, angular momentum about the center of mass. What's the angular momentum? Well, angular momentum, this, this is, we're playing the same game we played with the mass on the spring. Angular momentum, instead of being mass times velocity, it's rotational iner inertia times angular velocity. Okay, Now that's not angular frequency, it's angular velocity. It's d theta dt. We better write it that way. d theta dt. So if I put this, this is angular velocity. Not to be confused with angular frequency. Okay? d theta dt. Let's put that in for the uh, rate of change of angular momentum, and then I get something very similar to what we just had a minute ago. I get the rotational inertia times the second derivative of theta with respect to time squared is equal to minus mu b theta. Notice that I is a lot like mass, mu times b, it's an awful lot like a spring constant, and so if I, and this I is not current, the I is rotational inertia. Okay, so there's so many letters. Um, but if I rewrite this, let's go ahead and move this this way. D squared theta dt squared is minus some junk, mu b over rotational inertia times theta. I can apply exactly the same logic that I applied before. I can write theta as a function of time. I can take, it would go like a sine of a time, right? Theta, I could, let's do it. Theta is theta naught sine omega t d theta dt 
is going to be omega theta naught cosine omega t d squared theta dt squared. Let's keep going. That's going to be minus omega squared theta naught sine omega t. This is angular frequency. This here, that's angular frequency, not angular velocity. Right? Uh, and it's the same game. This omega squared has to match this junk. Right? Those guys have to be the same in order for this thing to work. And that's basically the whole game. Okay? We're going to be doing a laboratory in which we watch a magnetic dipole oscillate in a, in a magnetic field. And we're going to be looking for solutions where the frequency of that oscillation is related to the magnetic field strength, the rotational inertia, and the magnetic dipole moment of that dipole. The magnetic moment of the dipole, we don't know. We're going to have to figure that out experimentally. Okay, So that's the idea. Okay, I want to share with you some code to illustrate how this works uh, with a mass on a spring. And then I'm going to share with you some code to illustrate how this works with a magnetic dipole and a magnetic field. And then we'll actually dig into the experiment and you can see how it actually turns out in the laboratory. So uh, first of all, I just uh, picked a displacement of one meter. I'm making these numbers up just to illustrate the idea. We have a spring constant of one newton per um, meter. <clears throat> we have a mass of one kilogram. Uh, I'm gonna make the origin of the spring three meters to the left of the origin of, in the picture just to keep it keep the other end of the spring out of view or keep it from getting in the way. Um, I'm making a graph so I have a G curve function here. Uh, my object is going to be a sphere um, and here S is this is my spring. So this little utility function simply sets the axis of the spring and sets the position of the sphere every time we update X. And then here I'm just Going through, I'm going to start the velocity at zero, start the time at zero, have a tenth of a second time step, and I'm just going to repeat the following steps. I calculate the force, it's minus k times x, that's Hooke's law. I calculate the change in momentum, that's the momentum principle. I update the velocity, that's dp over m plus the old velocity. I update the position, that's just the position update. I update the time, I make a graph, and then I update the scene. Okay. See how that works. So you can see the mass goes back and forth. It's going to wiggle a few times and then it's going to stop because I told it to stop after 20 seconds. <clears throat> um, the uh, Let's see. I want to see what the period of this oscillation is. You can see it turns out to be 6.20 something, 6.28, I don't know. That's 2 pi, right? 6.28 is 2 pi. There's 12.5. Five, that's two oscillations, that's two, that's a four pi. Four pi. Okay, so um, how do we get two pi and four pi? Um, it's not so bad. Basically, uh, we decided that omega should be the square root of k over m. Uh, I've got a k of one newton per uh, meter. I've got a mass of one kilogram, so this should work out to be one radian per second, right? But remember, omega is also 2 pi divided by the period, so that means that 1 radian per second is 2 pi radians per period. That means the period has to be 2 pi seconds. Okay, that's the way it works out. Okay, so now it's the same idea. I want to make a little glow script program that illustrates how the magnetic dipole works in the same situation. Um, so here I've got a glow script program. I picked a magnetic field of one, a length, or a, uh, let's see, a, a length of one for the dipole, a rotational inertia of one, and a magnetic dipole moment of one, just to keep the numbers simple. Okay, obviously in a real magnet, the dimensions will be different, etc. cetera. But uh, the main point is uh, I'm, I'm making a graph just like before. I, I just Threw a couple of magnetic field arrows up there so you could see which way the magnetic field points. Here's my object. It's a cylinder, and I'm uh, because of the way glow script draws cylinders, you have to draw from one end to the other. So I have to go down uh, a little bit to the down to the left, and then draw the cylinder up to the right. Um, 
I've got an update scene, which is just updating the position and the axis of the cylinder as it oscillates, the position of one end is going to go up and down, and the axis is also going to go up and down, but it only depends on theta. Everything is determined by theta, so as theta changes, the thing uh, wiggles, basically. I'm going to start with no angular velocity. Um, I'm going to uh, start at time equals zero. I calculate the torque. Just like we said, it's minus uh, dipole moment times b times theta. It's an approximation to the sine of theta. It's the small angle approximation. I calculate the change in the angular momentum, which is the torque times the change in time. That's the angular momentum principle. I update omega. I update theta. I update the time. I'm going to plot theta as a function of time, and then I'm going to update the angle of the of the uh, dipole. So that's really all there is to it. Let's go ahead and run it and see what it looks like. There you have it. There's an oscillating dipole in the magnetic field. And because of the numbers that I picked, uh, let's see what the period is. Oh my golly, it turns out the period is 2 pi. For exactly the same reason it was 2 pi when I had a mass of 1 kilogram, a spring constant of 1 newton per, kilo, or one newton per meter. Um, omega was 1. Here, omega is 1 because it's the square root of uh, u times b over the rotational inertia. All those things are 1, so I get the square root of 1 is omega, so omega is 1, and that means t has to be 2 pi. If you change the numbers, of course, it'll affect the value of omega. What we're going to be doing in the lab is adjusting the magnetic field strength. That's going to affect the effective spring constant. That's going to change the frequency. So we're going to graph the frequency and the magnetic field strength uh, in order to get a straight line. It won't be it won't be one-to-one. -one. It'll have to be some other mathematical function, which uh, part of your job is to figure that out. So, okay. Hi, guys. How you doing? I'm, uh, I'm here in the lab. Here you go. I've got a, uh, a power supply, just like the ones we used earlier. I've also got, let's see if I can flip it around here. I guess I can't while I'm taking a video. I've also got this apparatus. I'm going to show you this apparatus that's... Uh, it's basically some coils of wire that are connected to the power supply there, you see. And uh, we're going to be using these same coils of wire next week in a different experiment to measure the relative, the ratio of the electrons charged to its mass. Um, this week we're using the, this particular arrangement of, of coils of wire is uh, nice because it's got a very uniform magnetic field at the center of the coils. Halfway between the coils, you can see I've got a dangling uh, magnet. That's just a permanent magnet. It's got some old masking tape on it. It's not the world's most lovely magnet, but it uh, it's not it's suspended there on a string right in the middle of the coils. These are called Helmholtz coils because of the geometry of the setup. Um, and it's right now it's at rest and it's in equilibrium because it's sort of lined up more or less with the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and it's it's on a tiny thread, which the thread is also going to act a little bit like a spring, because if you wind and unwind the thread a little bit, it's going to produce a torque. But I hope you can see that the thing is sort of wiggling back and forth there. It's oscillating in the Earth's magnetic field. So what I want to do right now is to time that. And uh, unfortunately, I'm going to use my phone to time it, and I'm using my phone to take a video. So... Uh, I'm going to have to stop recording the video to time it, but it, let's just look. It looks like it's about 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. It's 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000. It's roughly two seconds, period. But I'm going to time it much more precisely, and then we'll look at the data. Okay, okay so I just timed it, and it ended up taking about uh, 29 seconds for 10 oscillations. So that's... Uh, way different. Uh, that's almost three seconds, very nearly three seconds. So I was pretty wrong. Um, let's look at the table. So I made a table on the board here. I've got the current in the first column. I've got the number of oscillations, the total number, 10 oscillations, and I got the time that it took. If we were doing this in the lab, what I would do is have a bunch of people with stopwatches all measure the same uh, event, and then we'd get five or six different time measurements, and we take the average of those to try to improve our statistics. But I don't have 10 of you here, and uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go ahead and use that number, 29 seconds. Um, it was actually 29.00, amazingly, and it's a, uh, 
a hundredth of a second resolution stopwatch. So I was pretty uh, impressed by that. Anyway, let's do another one. Okay, so now I'm I'm at the power supply. I'm going to go ahead and turn the current up to about a. Uh, let's go ahead and get it to about a tenth of an amp. Uh, yeah. We're sitting at about half a volt, and it's uh, just a little over a tenth of an amp, 0.109 amps. And uh, let's look at the thing. I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually oscillating a little bit faster now, because now there's current in those coils, and so it's not just the Earth's magnetic field, it's sitting in the magnetic field produced by those coils. So let me take a measurement, and we'll move on. Okay, so that time, let's just go back here. We still have a current of about 0.109. So coming up here, we have, uh, let's do it this way, 0 0.10, whoopsie, ah, 0 0.09. We still did 10 oscillations, and it was 19.91. Okay, those were the, that was the time I had on my stopwatch for 10 oscillations. 19.91 seconds, all right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn the current up again. Let's go... Um, go ahead and get this, maybe that's uh, one volt, okay, we're about two tenths of an amp now, okay, and let's, uh, let's go back and look at the magnet, it looks like it might be wiggling just a little bit faster, let's okay, so that turned out to be 16.06, .06. I have now uh, also turned up the the current a little bit higher here. I'm at about 340 milliamps. I've got the thing going a little bit faster. Let's time this one. Okay, so at 340 milliamps, we had about 13.29 seconds. Let's go ahead and dial that current up a little bit more. Um, let's see what that is. That's 400 and Let's let it settle down, 460-something milliamps. Okay. I'm just going to let that cook for a minute, and uh, let's go ahead and make a measurement. You can see it's, it's wiggling pretty, pretty much faster now. Okay, so that was 1165 seconds for 10 oscillations and a current of 0.469. Now I'm, um, I've gone ahead and turned the current up to six tenths of an amp. Uh, I switched over to current regulation just to get a little bit more stable current since that's what we really care about. Uh, so you can see it's pretty much rock solid now. And I've got the thing wiggling. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit too much wiggle maybe. I need to dial it down a little bit. But anyway, uh, let's get another measure. Okay, so that was 0.601 amps and it was about 10.73 seconds. For 10 oscillations. So I'm going to go ahead and add a, start another column, start another table, and uh, crank that current up just a little bit more. So here it is at 0.601 amps. You can see it's tick, tick, tick. Now if I go in here and turn it up, let's just bump it up to 0.8. 1, 2, 0.8. Now look at it. Tick, 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 just a little bit faster. Uh, if I took it up to if I take it all the way up to 1.5 amps, now you can really see tick, 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 tick. It's going considerably faster. I'm not going to do that right away. I just wanted to give you the sense of it. Um, take it up to 2 amps. Now you can see it's really tick, tick. It's kind of hard to watch now. Um, I need to let it settle down a little bit, probably. Tick, 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 like that. That's at uh, 2.1 amps. Of course, now we're, we're putting uh, how much power? Um, 12 watts of power in the thing, so that's, uh, that's starting to be substantial. Anyway, back down to, uh, where were we? 0.8. Let me take a couple more measurements, and I'll just post these to the table. So this is the data that 
we collected the first number of data points were these guys and then um, <clears throat> those are the ones I collected after after the end I I added some uncertainties in the various things the current we had a nice current meter which gave us pretty high precision uh, just down to the milliamp or so we had I was counting oscillations as the thing sped up it got harder and harder to tell exactly when the oscillation began and stopped so I I think I'm good within like a quarter of an oscillation something like that and then finally of course there's the human reaction time so anyway these are the numbers you should use I'll post a link to this in the critic assignment when it's time to uh, to work on this okay so uh, now we've done the experiment we've looked at the theory we're gonna need to analyze that data we've collected to see if we can figure out what the actual dipole moment of that thing is so so let's look at that <clears throat> oh where's my pen okay so I've got uh, let's see I'm out of focus here I've got the relationship hang on I'll give, give it something to focus on <clears throat> Beautiful. Okay, I've got the relationship here um, that we worked out for the mass on a spring. It was a similar deal for the um, dipole moment in a magnetic field. It was mu b over the rotational inertia was omega. <clears throat> Here's the problem. The b came in part from the magnetic field from the coils, and it also had a contribution from the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field was combining with the field from those coils to produce a net magnetic field. So this field here is actually not the magnetic field from the coil. It's the sum of the coil field plus the magnetic field of the Earth. Right? And unfortunately, um, we don't have any control over the magnetic field of the Earth. And... Uh, I don't really know even exactly what it is. So it's going to help me out if I rewrite this expression to be something is equal to B. That way, uh, I'll, let's just do it. So if I square both sides, <coughs> multiply by I, divide by mu, I get the magnetic field of the coil plus the magnetic field of the Earth is equal to what? It's going to be omega squared times the rotational inertia divided by the di magnetic dipole moment. Now I measured this effectively. I measured the current in the coil and from the current in the coil we can calculate the magnetic field. And I measured omega. Well I measured the time for 10 oscillations from which you can compute omega. So what I would suggest you do is you you graph the magnetic field of the coil on the y-axis, graph omega squared on the x-axis, and you can see from this expression that should be a straight line. Uh, let's rewrite it. Actually, I'll rewrite it down here. B coil is equal to omega squared times the quantity I over mu plus uh, minus, excuse me, <clears throat> B Earth. And notice that this is a lot like Y is the vertical axis, the, hor the, the what would normally be the Y axis. Um, this is like M, this is my X, and this is my B. So this is the equation of a straight line where the y-intercept is minus the magnetic field of the Earth, where the slope is the rotational inertia divided by the magnetic dipole moment, and where omega squared behaves as my x-coordinate. <clears throat> so if I graph the magnetic field of the coil versus omega squared, I get a straight line with the slope equal to the rotational inertia divided by the magnetic dipole moment, and I get an intercept that's related to the magnetic field of the Earth. So that's the idea. Um, one of the goals of this course is that you get used to doing these analyses of data where you fit data to some kind of model and that you become familiar enough with that that you can sort of do it on your own. So for the next uh, project, which is to find the uh, electrons charge to mass ratio, 
I am going to be expecting you guys to figure it out. But it, this is the idea. You rewrite things so that you can get a straight line graph and then get the intercept and slope of that line. And from those two parameters, then you can go in and estimate <coughs> the actual magnetic dipole moment. What we're after here, we measure the rotational inertia. Well, we know the length of the magnet, we know the mass of the magnet, we know the diameter of the magnet. So we have a formula to calculate I. Um, we can get the magnetic field of the Earth, at least an approximation, by getting the intercept of that graph. That's a free measurement that you're making right there. Uh, the coil we get by knowing the current in the coil, and we know its dimensions. It's the radius of the coil, distance between the two coils, um, and uh, the number of turns of wire in the coil. So everything we can get, and we measure omega by measuring the number of the seconds that it takes this thing to wiggle you know, a certain number of times. And everything else we know, but we don't know mu. So the idea, <coughs> excuse me, the idea is to figure out mu. So that's the question. What the heck is the magnetic dipole moment of that magnet? You can collect the data, you can analyze it, and you can make a case. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon.